Alrighty, welcome to the Celtics Lab podcast, where usually we're no slant, no rant, level measured coverage of the Boston Celtics. Yeah. But you know what? Uh, this time around, it might not be the case because we are headed to the NBA Finals. I'm Let's host, go! I'm your host, Cameron Tuffetsby. That's Alex Goldberg, and I'm, we're with Dr. Justin Quinn. Hi. It is about, I don't know, 20 hours since the Celtics punched their ticket to the Finals. Uh, I'm going to ask you guys how you're feeling. I'm feeling surprised is the word that I would use to describe my feelings. Alex, how are you? I am feeling vindicated, Cam. Oh. That's how I'm feeling. Okay. Uh, hold on to that. I'm going to ask you about that later in full. Yeah. Dr. Quinn? Uh, if there was a good word that could combine, combine sleepy or exhausted even <laughs> with, with ecstatic, maybe there is, but I'm too dumb right now to think of it. So that. Yeah, I'll I'll celebrate Dr. Quinn and and tell folks how the sausage gets made. That that once the horn sounds, all the content has to get pushed out. So all of the written stuff that you see on Twitter or Facebook right after the game that gets written sometime between the third or fourth quarter. Um, so if you notice that Dr. Quinn, and to a much lesser extent, I drop off on Twitter when the game gets good, it's because we're doing stuff. So. Uh, yeah, Justin, I know that you had a super busy night last night, but I'm sure you celebrated as well. Um, all right, we are going to talk about the game. We're going to talk about the series that was the Eastern Conference Finals. We're going to talk a little bit of news, and we will preview the upcoming finals, that series, a little bit, but surely this week we'll get to another podcast uh, in more depth. So we'll give you a little bit of a finals preview, but I'll have to come back for some more later in the week. And let's start with Game 7. Um Celtics were up. I think they always led or nearly always led. Always. Lots, always led. Lots of double digit leads, um, but it didn't feel like a wire to wire smackdown. Uh, certainly towards the end of the second or the first half, the end of the second quarter, Kyle Lowry did Kyle Lowry things. The Celtics didn't seem to have an answer. The refs seemed to be fine with it. Um, so it was a shaky game. I think what the Celtics led by a dozen with. 90 seconds to go, something crazy like that. And then they almost didn't lead. Um, so let me start with, uh, I'm going to go out of order on our rundown. Let's start with that Jimmy pull up three. Cause I've been thinking about it a lot. Um, right. I'm assuming anyone who's watched, yeah. who is listening to this podcast knows about the play. Um, Justin, I'll go to you first. How would you characterize that shot? A business decision, completely a business decision. He, yep. Looked at Al Horford, probably if he had not played for all 48 minutes of the entire game, probably would have taken it to him, hoped he got the, the bucket. Worst case scenario, ends up with two shots at the line, tie it up, go into overtime. But between the fact that he wasn't probably, I'm assuming, sure that that was going to happen with the level of energy he had, and the fact that a three-pointer would just completely remove all of those problems and catapult them into the finals, I think that's what he was thinking. Alex? Yeah, along the same lines. Um, listen, Jimmy Butler has played so well throughout the playoffs. You can make a credible argument that he's been the best player, period, in the playoffs. Um, he's earned every right to take that shot. And, uh, you know, Eric Spolstra said after the game that he had no problem with Jimmy taking it. Jimmy Butler is also a 28% three point shooter. And I think when that shot went up, obviously I felt super nervous just because that would be such an emphatic collapse if he hits that shot. Um, and, you know, Jimmy Butler is a killer. He can take those and make those. But at the end of the day, statistically, it probably was not the best shot for him to take in that situation. He made a business decision based on the flow of the game. Uh, the only real substantive analysis I have about it is that I'm glad it did not go in. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you play basketball for moments like that. The, these guys dream about moments like that. I would have taken a dribble. I would have set myself. He kind of leaned. He definitely forced the shot. And Justin, he was definitely tired. Um, I love the shot. It's chesty. It's what we love about Jimmy Butler. It's arrogant. Um, it's so entertaining. It's ill-advised. It's so fun. I would have just taken a dribble and and collected myself. But I guess that tells you something about his mindset. Um there's another three that we should talk about from that game, but I guess because Alex, you said the secret word. Um, many folks, it seems, thought that Jason Tatum was the best player in the Eastern Conference Finals. A uh, friend of the podcast, Tim Bontemps, did not. 
He was the lone voter for Jimmy Butler for the first Larry Bird Trophy, the Eastern Conference MVP award. Yes, Justin? So I was thinking about this. Okay, yeah, go for it. And this is something I was thinking about. I'm actually working on a piece related to it uh, just, just before we get on here. And had that three-pointer gone in that we were just discussing, mm -hmm. how do we think the voting would have gone? I don't know. So really interesting question. <laughs> I, I assume the voting happens after the buzzer. Can we I would that? too, but we didn't have any, they didn't explain anything sure. like that. They just showed us the, the voters and it was all people uh, who I would assume mm -hmm. if they were not there or at least watching the game. So I, I would assume that that's what happened, yeah. Um, I think absolutely Jimmy would have won the award if he yeah. hit it. And I also think that Jimmy could have won the award if it wasn't the first time it was being given out. If this was the 12th Eastern Point. Conference MVP award, I think it's okay that it doesn't go to the winning, a player in the winning team. Um, but I do wonder if the momentum of the, the moment, I mean, Cedric Maxwell giving it out was, that doesn't feed into the, the voting, I don't think, but there was just something magic about it that it would have been a weird moment if Jimmy Butler, for the first time ever to get this award, had to like weave his way through the Celtics to go get it. So um, yeah. if he hit the shot, he would have gotten it because Jimmy Butler played like a, a man possessed Alex, you're right. All playoffs, not just this round. Um, any, Alex, anything we missed? I think that's largely right. I mean, the only thing that I would say is just that the Celtics had, I think, multiple players who were in pretty serious contention for this award. Um, and we were talking about that a little bit kind of in the game five preview. Obviously, a lot of things happened between that or sorry, the game five wrap up. A lot of things happened between then and now. Like uh, we don't, yes, we don't have to go <laughs> over all of that. Um, I think, you know, Jalen Brown, Al Horford, even Derek White, to a certain extent, all had really good cases. But at the end of the day, Jason Tatum was the right pick for this award when the Celtics needed Jason Tatum to ball out in that game and keep their season alive. He did it. He answered the call. He had multiple incredibly important clutch buckets down the stretch of game seven when the Celtics offense really did not look good for stretches. Um, and he's a deserving winner of that award. Yeah. So I, I want to talk about the Struce uh, three that got called back, but rather than, I mean, we were still celebrating here. Um, so rather than do legal easing, I'm going to do what I've been doing for the past few podcasts. Give me a player that you want to talk about for 30 seconds. You can pick whoever you want. Um, because I'm springing this on you, I'll go first. Um, I talk about Marcus Smart. Um, he and Horford provided veteran leadership. They, they made plays and they played defense when it did look like the Jays at times had the yips. And I think that that was really critical. Um, Marcus Smart down the stretch, uh, opened the third in a really crucial way, making plays, making plays for his teammates, um, really set the tone there. And then the Marcus Smart experience pendulum swung and we almost uh, really had a situation on our hands. I mean, the, the way that we talk about the NBA is so results driven that it's water under the bridge, I suppose. But Marcus Smart nearly, I don't know, lost the game for the Celtics, but certainly nearly uh, he made it a lot harder um but he made those free throws he did play defense so um the marcus smart experience is like nothing else in professional basketball and love to hate it hate to love it whatever it is it was on full display um all right uh alex i've got to you pick a player you want to talk about i mean if we're going to talk about impact celtics in this series uh who stepped up when they needed to we can't talk about it without mentioning big al horford Mm -hmm. who has, I think, become just a critical piece to everything that this team does. After the game, Jalen Brown and Al Horford had a joint press conference uh, where they kind of talked through um, the end of game seven and kind of heading into the finals. And it, it was just so clear in kind of Jalen's approach to that conference how much Horford means to this squad. And like those guys all look up to him to be the leader in rough moments when things get a little dicey. Um, when there is tension in the locker room, which I think based on everything we've heard, it seems like has happened a lot this season, even in the playoffs. You know, I think Marcus Smart, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, these guys are all, you know, pretty feisty personalities in a lot of ways. And Horford is there to kind of set the tone, to kind of keep things calm, even when they probably would not be all that calm or when it wouldn't be easy. 
um, you know, seeing him just kind of crumble to the floor uh, in that moment when he realized that the Celtics were actually going to the finals, that he was finally going to break through after, like, I, Justin, do you remember the amount of games that Horford has played in the playoffs without making the finals? I'm trying to look it up. Like 140 or something yeah, ridiculous just like that. To, to, to be on the losing end of these kind of series for so long and to finally break through, you could just see all over Al what this meant to him. And boy, did he play a great game when the Celtics needed him the most. He did not score a lot, but he had 14 rebounds and was a force around the rim. I mean, he was just getting everything that he could, contesting shots, blocking shots, making things difficult on the Heat's uh, scorers. And, you know, I just, I can't say enough about how important Al has been for the Celtics playoff run. And, you know, he's, he just guaranteed himself a big chunk of extra money as well. He earned $5 million uh, in his contract for making the finals and was supposed to earn more for potentially winning the finals. But earlier today, Wick Grosbeck just guaranteed that they were going to pay him no matter what. And I think that that's a totally justifiable decision because Horford has earned every inch of that contract. They're paying the tax next year anyway. They might as well. Yeah. So that $5 million is for next year's contract? Yes. Yeah. Okay, it wasn't. However, it. we should bring up, this isn't on the rundown, but the Celtics are just under $350,000 under the cap. If they win the title, they will be over the cap, and I'm sure they won't care. Yeah, I don't think they will either. Um, Jalen Brown has a, a bonus. Cool. But well deserved. Um, Dr. Quinn talked about a player that you want to talk about. Well, since he managed to rope in Jalen Brown in that, I am going to talk about both Robert Williams and Derek White, both cool. because of very different reasons doing the same thing. Uh, Derek White really bailing the Celtics out several times also earlier in the game, uh, yeah. as he did at several other points in other games, almost doing so uh, in game six before things went to hell. We don't need to talk about that. It's in the past. I have memory wiped it. Uh, but also Robert Williams, who has a reputation uh, of being often hurt, and he is often hurt, but he also kind of gets some whispers of, you know, not being manly and tough and being out on the floor when it counts. And he was on one damn leg and still being kind of effective. I, I mean, that you try doing something on one leg, never mind playing high level, you know, NBA basketball. Uh, the fact that he was able to continue to deter people from driving into the lane as well as he was. It has me very hopeful, and we can talk about this a lot more uh, in the coming week, uh, hopeful for the health of him and Marcus Smart as well going into this series. So I just want to give a little bit of flowers to Rob uh, for gutting it out, making an impact, and probably tilting the balance, to be honest. Yeah, to your point, he, I mean, he wasn't the featured player, but the moments that he did play, first of all, were really admirable, but also incredibly effective. And I think... This isn't the preview pod for the finals, but I think that that's going to be key. Um, all right, we, we'll do a little legal ease and then we'll keep celebrating. So um, I want to say something that's probably not well received, which is I actually didn't think that this past game uh, was that poorly officiated. I thought it was consistently officiated. Well, um, there were consistent mistakes, but they were evenly spread and, and so it wasn't that, end, that bad. So to that end, the Kyle Lowry play at the end of the first half uh, where Horford gets called for a foul. Two things I want to say about that. First, Smart did the exact same thing to Bam two minutes before. And second, uh, Horford did go over the top of a player over a rebound. That's usually a foul. Um, and what it I want to say is... Foul. It was not even questionable. Uh, I guess other people think otherwise. I want to say that if you watch the play materialize, the second the shot is up, Smart looks over his shoulder and sticks his ass out to catch Bam with a box out, which is what you're supposed to do. And Lowry does the same thing on the, the play a few minutes later where he sticks his ass out. Horford is 10 feet away from him and he established this position for a box out, which is A, if you're a young basketball player, figure out how to put that in your repertoire. But B, is something that not every Celtics player does or not every NBA player does. We've seen a lot of bad rebounding from this team. Um, so yes, Smart and Lowry embellished calls and uh, created contact that was worthy of a foul there, but only because they did the right thing immediately. We um, both flopped, so, but I mean, everybody flops and I'm really and tired of hearing about people. 
Great. Right. They put themselves in position to do that flop. You know what I mean? Like there's something cheesy about a flop, but you do have to do everything right to get to that point with exception. I mean, someone can elbow you and you go like this, but I uh, mean, that's all fair. I'm just, I'm personally so glad to be finished with the Kyle Lowry experience. I have hated playing against Kyle Lowry in the playoffs for many years in large part because, and I, I'm saying this fully aware as a guy who has supported Marcus Smart through every single bit of his NBA career. And uh, many people react the same way about Marcus. I cannot stand watching Kyle Lowry play basketball. He is among the most infuriating players I've ever seen. Well, the good news is that uh, Draymond Green plays for the Warriors, so you won't uh, put that up. stuff <laughs> cold turkey. Um, let's t- let's talk about the Struce thing. I don't know however long people want to. For those who don't know, sometime in the second quarter, I believe, uh, it was after a TV timeout, I think, they called back a three saying that uh, Struce had stepped out of bounds. His left heel um, supposedly stepped out of bounds and they took a three off the board. Um, Eric Spolstra, after the game, uh, was pretty vehement saying that this was an incorrect procedure and it, it really messed up the flow of the game, which at the time I didn't think was that uh, innocuous, but I also don't know that I think he stepped out of bounds. Um, he stepped out of bounds. I um, don't know that. So apart from the, the incredibly obscure legalese about when they can review that, I'm not even going to try to think about in this moment. In terms of overturning a call like that, my understanding is that it needs to be conclusive. And for me, that was not conclusive. So here's what y'all are missing, which is that there's another camera angle. So I've seen the clip. There's another camera angle in which you can pretty see clearly see that the back of Struce's heel is on the line. Um, so I think the, the angle that they show in the broadcast is definitely not one that looks uh, super conclusive, but, uh, you know, trolling around Twitter and watching people react to that comment and then uh, checking out the rest of those threads, you can see there's some footage there. Struce stepped out of bounds. And I think there's understandable reasons to be upset about this if you're a Heat fan in large part because not of the fact that Struce stepped out of bounds so much as the fact that um, it took, you know, four possessions before they waved this thing off. Um, if you do, I mean, if you do want to get into the weeds of it, again, we don't have to do it here in this pod, and that would be pretty boring. If you do want to get into the weeds of it, I would invite you to kind of check out the rule book uh, in a more kind of thorough manner. There is precedent for this. It involves a yeah, lot definitely. of technical mumbo jumbo, but um, long story short, Strew stepped out of bounds. Um, pulling back the points while uncommon is actually something that the refs have the authority to do. It's happened to uh, the Celtics before. In, in that situation. And um, kind of crucially, I think we have to also take into account that this is not the reason that the Miami Heat lost this game. No. I mean, I, I understand why Spolstra has to say something to go to bat for his guys if they were angry about this. Um Alex, I mean, I think that's a really good point. I, something I said earlier today on Twitter was that the NBA needs to get control of the narrative because too much energy is, is spent talking about the refs in a way that for an entertainment product is pretty lame. Um, and whether it's better transparency with their like uh, two minute report or whatever, but but that ABC didn't have the broadcast angle that someone else did is shocking to me because it takes away from the conversation of the game and yes, content is content and it doesn't matter if it's good. We've talked about this last podcast, um, but it's very frustrating to try to be engaged in a conversation about the game and the game conversation ultimately being about refing and procedure, not about hoops. Um, so good to know. I am op- I'm very open to the suggestion that there's a better camera angle, but ABC has more money than God, figure it out. I don't know. Uh, anything else about game about the Eastern Conference Finals before we move on. Cool. Um, I have two things. First, uh, our, our deepest condolences to the Horford family. Um, that is a hard thing to, to play through. That's a hard thing to experience. And grandpas are awesome. Um, so we're thinking of you. Um, and also, I want to take a page out of Udoka's book and close this chapter of the podcast by just saying that uh, the disaster in Texas, the, the tragedy in Texas is not far from our thoughts, even if we're talking about basketball here, that's 
continues to be more important and pressing. And just because the media cycle has the attention of a goldfish doesn't mean that our collective conscious should. So um, thanks, Coach Udoka, for making that abundantly resonant. Um, all right. I wrote something over at Celtics Wire about, hey, if you were making a sports movie, the, the finals is just like a paragraph that they put on the screen about like what happens because the mountain that the Celtics just summited is worth recognizing that the team that was 23 and 24 in January that looked angry, that blew leads, that uh, we wanted to break up, maybe not us, but collectively we wanted to break up. They're going to the finals. Um, and a stat that I'll, I'll share that I think punctuates this is uh, per our friend, Tim Bontemps, this is only the fourth time in 40 years that a team with two stars, 25 or younger, have made the finals. Um, I think it was the 84 Rockets, the 95 Magic, and the, the 12 Thunder, or give or take a year. And importantly, A, young, young stars don't make the finals, just not a thing. But B, none of those teams went back to the finals. It's really hard to go to the NBA finals. And the Celtics did so with a sub 500 record in January. I mean, this is extraordinary stuff. Um, so I wanna ask you guys this, when did you know? Um, do you have a memory? I know in bits and spurts at times on the podcast or in the DMs or on Twitter or texts, we have made mention of like, the pieces are fitting, it's happening. Um, and I'm wondering if there was a moment for you guys that, uh, that maybe um, pray tell you can share. Dr. Quinn, I'll steal that in early February, I looked back and you have a DM that said, if, if they do this correctly, they can go to the conference finals. And if they get lucky, they can go further than that. And you got everyone in the DM to either give a fire emoji or heart emoji. Um, so I'll give you that little timestamp, but maybe you have another memory. So um, Alex or Justin, when did you know? Uh, I'm happy to go with this one. I knew I have a specific game and a specific date that I knew that the Celtics had a real shot at this thing. Um, so this was a little bit after Jalen Brown famously tweeted that the energy is going to shift. Um, the Celtics were in the middle of a nice little run, um, a run against some not so great teams. And I think when I was looking at the Celtics playing at that time, I was thinking, they're playing better. Maybe this will be a shot for them to, you know, get into the playoffs and do some damage. Ultimately, I wasn't quite on board with the idea that they were going to make a serious finals run until a specific thing happened, which is that the Celtics traded for Derek White, brought him in, and he was immediately an impact player. Uh, I'm thinking of a specific game, February 11th, against the reigning MVP, Nikola Jokic, and the Denver Nuggets. Um, mm -hmm. At that point, it had become pretty clear that Jokic was, at the very least, going to be in serious MVP discussions again. And then, of course, he would ultimately end up winning it. Um, in that game, the Celtics ended up winning it 108 to 102. Jason Tatum played a pretty complete game. Robert Williams had 16 rebounds. And crucially, Derek White played and played well. And in seeing that consolidated rotation with Derek White, um, I think I'm pulling up his stats now. Yeah, he had 15 points four rebound, uh, six rebounds and two assists and was a plus 11 for the game off the bench. Seeing him come in and immediately make an impact and then seeing what would ultimately become the Celtics eight man rotation in action of um, the starters plus Williams, White and Pritchard as the kind of three primary bench guys. I mean, that is the recipe that has gotten the Celtics to where they are. Watching that game happen and watching them take it to the MVP um, a Nuggets team that at the time was actually playing pretty well. Of course, their season trailed off a little bit later. But seeing that recipe for the first time all assembled on the floor, I think that's when I started to realize, like, this team has a real shot. And that night, I actually made the now ubiquitous um, official Ime Udoka apology form, <laughs> which has been circulating on the Internet for some time. Uh, if you see that, folks, that's me. I made that. Uh, I'm that guy. Um, but, yeah, that was the moment. All right, Dr. Quinn, what about you? I didn't have a moment. I never had a moment. The problem with me was that I was a Celtics truther to the point where <laughs> it was starting to make me feel like I was a moron for the first half of the season. Yeah. Uh, like, 
I think back to that double overtime loss to the Washington Wizards very early in the season. I, I just started thinking to myself, maybe I'm not as good at analyzing basketball as I thought I was, because this team should be way better than this. And <laughs> they they turned out to be. Uh, not exactly through the things that I have been, you know, ranting and raving, but close enough, more ball movement, more defense, playing together, all the stuff that we had been yelling at the TV for most of the first half of the season. So for me, there wasn't really ever a moment where I, I realized how good they could be because I already believed that. The thing for me was when I started to get into the depths of worry in December. And I couldn't tell you exactly when it was. It was just very, very dispiriting that it kept happening. The Celtics kept beating themselves more than anyone else. And really the only way for young teams with young stars to get through that is to go through the crucible of sucking, right? And most top picks go to teams where they suck. And these guys never did, really. Not to the degree that you really need to like hate losing as much as, you know, because like these guys are coming into situations for the first time in their careers, usually where they're going to be on a bad team. And these guys never were. So in my mind, I started wondering in December if maybe, maybe that that was the problem and that the, the suffering they would need to go through would end up having to be on other teams. I started to wonder if maybe just maybe all those guys were right that they needed to split them up. I never wanted to. I wanted to write it to the end. I don't want you to get the wrong idea about what I'm saying. But there was never a moment I didn't believe they could work. I just started to worry they might that I might be wrong. Yeah, I had a similar experience. I In our preseason pod, like the week before the season started, I think I picked them highest at like second or third, maybe second. In the, and and yeah. the thinking was, why couldn't these pieces work? Um, why couldn't they swing for a trade or work Schroeder in or, or whatever? Um, so I think we have been pretty high on them, maybe vis-a-vis other shock jockeys that we knew that, hey, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, early, probably in December, a friend of the podcast, Ben Kalupik, our draft insider, said to me, are the Celtics okay? And I said, yeah, they'll be fine. And I remember spending the next few weeks like living with deep, deep cognitive dissonance of like, oh no, I, I am wrong about this. They won't be fine. For me, it was March. Um, I've said it a bunch of times. My opinion is that the NBA Finals is usually won by the best player, not the best team. And uh, the Celtics didn't have that for a while, but when Jason Tatum came alive and what did he win? Three players of the week in the month of March or something like that. When he went supernova, that was when it really became clear that like, Oh, okay. It's not that they'll win the first round of the playoffs. It's that they can go toe to toe with Giannis or Durant, which obviously that was a little more complicated. Um, they can have the best player in a series and the next series in the series after that, which nearly is what happened. Um, Tatum was never outright the best player in the series, but at times he was the best player playing the game. And that was super, super valuable. Um, so I think that's when the vision became clear in March. I think I have texts and DMs saying, I think Alex, you're the first person who in our DM said in bold, the Celtics, I think if I may paraphrase folks, the Celtics are winning the NBA finals. That sounds like something you would say. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to applaud us for not losing our pool too much, but I also want to make clear my stance. And I suspect you agree that this is something like a Cinderella story, that this is highly, oh, yeah. highly improbable stuff, um, which is good for us because it's more fun to podcast about this than the off season or draft day fake trades. That'll never happen. But um, I have lowest point of the season on the docket, but screw that. That's not fun. Um, let's, let's stay on that. The lowest point of the season is RJ Barrett, uh, off the of glass. I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> uh, well, mine was speaking of glass, finding out Marcus Park had glass in his hand, but so far so good. <laughs> that, that got you upset, man. That got me low. That was my lowest. That was when I stopped believing for the, the longest stretch. Um, but Hey, sort of, I was almost right. And sort of Marcus was almost right. Here we are. Okay. <laughs> we have a little bit of news. We'll do a little bit of a finals preview and then we'll be out of here. Um, Al Horford, again, uh, as we have alluded to, just snapped his unfortunate title of uh, most playoff games without a finals appearance because he is off to the finals. Um, he is going to make f- uh, $5 million guaranteed, and 
Alex, actually, I didn't know this. Um, I've been out of pocket all day. Can you fill me in? So they said his contract will be guaranteed next season. Yeah, so Wick Grosbeck uh, earlier today announced that Al Horford was going to get his full contract for next season guaranteed, regardless of whether he uh, the Celtics won the finals or not, which I think is just a nice show of respect for how important he's been for the playoff run. And also, I think, frankly, uh, it might be a little bit of a way to just like settle that now so that Al is not nervous about that in the back of his mind as he's playing in the finals. Um, I think it's a smart move by Wick for a team that is going to, as Justin mentioned, in all likelihood be in the tax anyway, may as well get it done now. And that's, it's like 28.4 million or something. Yeah, I think that's about right. About that, about that neighborhood, yeah. Cool. Um, I am of the mind and have been for the past few weeks that don't worry about the off season and the fake trades and the roster construction. We have 10 months a year to do that. Let's worry about the playoffs. Um, Speaking of which, the schedule for the finals is way lighter. Um, There's usually two or three games between uh, the action, especially with travel days. Um, So, for example, uh, the first game in Boston is not until Wednesday of next week. Um, How important is rest for the Celtics? And it's a little bit of a rhetorical question, but uh, we can. It's freaking critical. (laughs) There's no way. If if, if smart can't cover Curry, this series is over. Mm -hmm. Easier said. Yeah, it's. It's critical for Marcus Smart, who mentioned that the entire left side of his body is in pain, which is maybe not great. (laughs) Um, You know, he played well enough last night. I think Marcus will be okay, but um, he's definitely going to need it. And it's critical for Robert Williams in particular, who I think will do more intensive uh, series preview stuff next time. But I've identified Robert Williams as one of the key X factors for the Celtics and his mobility and ability to stay on the court. So getting three days of rest for both of those guys after two brutal series in a row, I think is really, really, really important. It's also worth mentioning that there are multiple gate, multiple day gaps between every game of the series, except for I think one of them. So that's going to be a big help for Boston as well. Yeah, that's going to be huge. I mean, Everyone is hurting. It's not just the Celtics. It's not just the Heat, but um, that's a tremendous boost um, for a Celtics team that I'm sure after two seven-game series needs a little bit of a breather. Um, Same thing, but different. Another thing that I think might uh, help the Celtics is all of this adversity. Justin, you kind of made mention that like young teams kind of need to fall down to figure out who you are when you get back up. And for lots of complicated reasons, yes, the Celtics have lost games, but they've been not like to make them 20 and uh, 62 in the season, but they lose big high profile playoff games. So they haven't been tested in the way that young players are usually tested. Um, and I would hazard that we've seen a lot of uh, why that is an issue. Jalen Brown has played bo- like a bonehead for a little bit. Jason Tatum has played like a bonehead for a little bit. Even Grant Williams from game seven hero in the second series to never really finding his offensive footing uh, in against Miami a little bit here and there. I mean, played phenomenal defense, but do you think that we'll see even a little more growth out of these young guys? Or do you think, unfortunately, perhaps that the baggage that comes with being young guys is still going to be on display? And I, I think they have I some more that. development, you know, in their game, mostly exercising stupid things and, keeping the easy elements of their game in their four in their four four thoughts uh i forget where i heard it but just the idea of ways that you can make the game easier for yourself you know like running up the court more Mm -hmm. that's something that players often don't do because it makes them tired but they don't realize that if you spend the entire possession trying to find something to work by throwing the ball around and staying active, that you actually probably expend more energy. So just little things like that, I think, as well as like skill acquisition, uh, somebody in particular working on their handle, I won't name names. Yeah, my goodness. There were a few times in game se- this past game seven down the stretch where the Celtics didn't run offense. And I don't know if, the heat weren't allowing them to, or what was happening there, but uh, that feels so horrifyingly inexcusable, especially against the Warriors. But um, I guess 
time will tell. Um, a few quick things in the interest of news. Uh, Justin, tell us more about this. Paul Pierce is getting sued for a dump and pump uh, cryptocurrency scheme. Pump and dump. Yes. So basically, cryptocurrency and NFTs may not always be a scam, but because they are very unregulated in the way lots of other financial instruments are regulated by design, you know, that's part of the appeal to some people. Uh, I will not get into a long and vitriolic rant about that, but because they are not particularly well regulated, uh, very frequently there are situations which whether they are actually fraud or not, they appear to be fraud. Now, there is a realm, so let me, let me back up a little bit. Uh, the Ethereum Max uh, cryptocurrency that Pierce was the spokesperson for, he received in payment a large chunk of them, right? Now, it may be the case he's being sued because he got a bunch of people to invest in them and then the value plummeted and he had already taken his cryptocurrency out and turned it into cash. So that's what the whole pump and dump thing is. Now, there is a plausible explanation. It's a very plausible explanation. If you don't have a freaking clue what cryptocurrency is, for example, and I'm not saying this is what happened, but it could have happened, then maybe you take your money out as soon as you get paid and you put in something you do understand, like regular money. But in the end result, the other people who say maybe invested because they saw Paul Pierce uh, advocating for this cryptocurrency are now stuck with the bag or the lack of one, I should say. So what they're going to be doing really is determining like how much or if there was any insider information about the decrease of value and all that fun stuff. But the more I see these cryptocurrency, uh, shall we say, promotions uh, in the sports world, the more uncomfortable I get about them as a whole. Yeah, as an economics teacher, I'll just chime in and say my advice would be don't invest in crypto or NFTs or something like that if you're not prepared to lose all that money. It might be the case that you make generational wealth investing in that, but it's much more volatile than other investment tools. So do what you got to do. But if you were using this as your ace in the hole, I don't think that that's a smart use of your money. I will say, and then we'll get off this. I was talking to, I won't name names, a professional athlete recently who on his Twitter promotes uh, an NFT, not a board ape, but a similar line of, of NFTs. And I was asking him about it. And he said, yeah, they approached us. They said, if you just tweet this out, we'll give it to you. And not only did he get a free one for that endorsement, but he insisted on being paid in American dollars. So there's that. Um, so yeah, I would be weary of whether it's Larry David or the stadium in Los Angeles or whomever else, uh, just because they're advertising cryptocurrency doesn't mean that they put their full support behind it. Okay. Um, very quickly, if anyone wants to talk about it, Mike Breen has COVID. We wish him all the best. Jeff Van Gundy did not sound good in game seven, but it didn't sound as if, uh, at, at least the time of this recording, we don't know that he also had COVID. It just sounded like he was sick. Who do we think is calling? This is a, a ESPN and ABC have the, the series, yeah. correct? Yeah. It's just ABC for this for this round. Just ABC, yeah. Do we know? Yeah, but but ESPN commentators will be on the ABC broadcast, I believe. Sure. Um, so based on last night, you would have to assume, obviously, if Mark Jackson is healthy, Mark Jackson will be on the call for a lot of this. Um, I think the same will probably be true of Van Gundy, um, unless Van Gundy does not have co uh, does have COVID. If Van Gundy is sick, then you're looking at two slots to fill, one of which will probably be filled by Mark Jones based on the fact that he was calling last night's game. And I'm kind of of the opinion that it, Doris Burke is right there, folks. Like, she's been waiting on this for a long time. We know that she's got the goods. She's called games, high-profile games before. All this is to say the only real story about uh, Van Gundy and Breen's health other than get better guys is this might open up the door for Doris Burke to call a finals game, which would be really cool. Yeah, I desperately hope that that is uh, exactly what happens. Um, I can't think of someone other than Mike Breen who would be more qualified. Uh, anyone we missed, Dr. Quinn? Not that I can think of. I got to throw my support behind a Doris Burke candidacy as well. Uh, and 
frankly, if they don't go with her, just give me somebody who doesn't have really stupid, corny catchphrases and bad humor. So, yeah. Yeah, I know how much that <laughs> bothers the masses. All right. We have said a number of times we're not doing a preview pod here. We will do that sometime in the coming days. So make sure that you like and subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode. But let's do a little bit of finals preview. I mean, we've been thinking about it. So why don't we just go around the dial and either share what we're most excited about as basketball fans, or if this is where your thoughts are at, what you're most worried about as Celtics fans. And um, I'll go first. I am very excited to see what Clay Thompson has to offer. I have said before, Big Smokey is probably my favorite NBA player. I think that he, when he is healthy and playing the way that we have seen him play in the past, really, really exciting player. And I also think that this Warriors team at full tilt is really interesting um, and as much as I, yeah, I'll be open. I'd rather see the Celtics win than not. I want to see the, what the Warriors can do. So I'm really hoping that Clay Thompson is more like the Clay Thompson from the past than what we've seen as of late from Clay Thompson. Um, either one of you, what are you looking for in this series? Um, the thing that I'm looking forward to is the thing that I am also the most scared of, which is the chess match that is going to happen between Jason Tatum and Draymond Green. Uh, you've got Jason Tatum emerging as a two-way superstar, potentially, um, you know, Steph Curry is probably the best offensive player in this series, but Jason Tatum is right there behind him at this point. And I think it's pretty clear that Jason Tatum is now the centerpiece of the Celtics offensive plans in just about every way. Uh, he is also going up against one of the league's greatest defenders in Draymond Green and a guy who, frankly, I think might be the smartest basketball player I've ever seen. Um, and I think watching those two go at it on a possession to possession basis, because you assume that in crunch time, Draymond is going to be the guy guarding Jason Tatum above all else um, is going to be fascinating. Obviously they have a little bit of history. They both played on team USA together. Jason Tatum was on Draymond Green's podcast a couple of months ago. Uh, and I think they have a lot of respect for each other as players and I just think that the twists and turns of that individual matchup are going to be absolutely fascinating to watch. I would just keep piling it on in that regard and that from the aesthetics of the game to the corporal knowledge of the Warriors compared with the fountain of youth you can find in the Celtics, uh, there's just so many different elements that are very well balanced in the series so i think it's going to be a really fun series and ultimately i'm i'm just really excited that we get to watch a style of basketball as much as i love you know 1990s big east style defensive monstrosities i am i've had my fill <laughs> i'm good next year we can have more but give me some beautiful game yeah i'm curious to see if the celtics try to slow things down or try to keep up. Um, but we will get into that. To the Boston Celtics for returning to the NBA Finals for the first time since 2010. Yes, um, let's go. Um, and Alex, <laughs> I'm going to text you about our basketball league and also go to the Celtics game, maybe. Justin, enjoy your evening in Mexico. I shall. I'm going to take a nap. I can't wait. All right, thanks, everyone.